And so it was that around midnight on January the 24th, the B-52 rendezvoused with a Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker off the American East Coast to carry out a scheduled mid-air refueling. But while carrying out the hookup, the crew of the tanker informed Major Tulloch that his aircraft had a severe fuel leak in its right wing. Ground Control then ordered Tulloch to abort the refueling and assume a holding pattern off the coast to burn off fuel before landing. However, upon reaching his assigned station, Tulloch reported that he was now losing more than 500 kilograms or 1,100 pounds of fuel every minute and was immediately ordered to land back at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. But as the B-52 descended towards the runway, the right wing suddenly tore off and as the aircraft spiraled towards the ground, Tulloch ordered his crew to bail out. Though all crew aboard the B-52G variant were provided with ejection seats, only five managed to escape with one, third pilot Lieutenant Adam Maddox, being the only recorded person to successfully bail out of a B-52 top hatch without an ejection seat. Of these five, one, radar navigator Major Eugene Shelton, died on impact with the ground, while electronic warfare instructor Major Eugene Richards and gunner technical sergeant Francis Barnish failed to escape the aircraft and died in the ensuing crash. One of the survivors, Electronic Warfare Officer First Lieutenant William Wilson, later described his experience. I don't know how it happened. I know when I landed in the field, I felt awfully good. I felt like running. I went to a house and a fellow got his wife up and they fixed some coffee. They thought at first I was a prowler when I told them I had jumped out of an airplane. I must have been bad looking. While co-pilot Major Richard Harden recalled, I could see three or four other chutes against the glow of the wreckage. The plane hit 10 or 12 seconds after bailout. I hit some trees, I had a fix on some lights, and started walking. My biggest difficulty getting back was the various and sundry dogs I encountered on the road. Meanwhile, the pilotless aircraft broke up into several large sections and impacted the ground near Faro, North Carolina, around 19 kilometers or 12 miles north of Goldsboro, spreading wreckage over an area of 5 square kilometers or 2 square miles. Within hours, Explosive Ordnance Disposal, or EOD teams from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base arrived and began searching for the aircraft's two Mark 39 thermonuclear bombs. Meanwhile, a team of specialists representing the Atomic Energy Commission, Sandia National Laboratories, Los Alamos National Laboratory, and the Air Force Nuclear Weapons Center, or AFNWC, flew in from Kirkland Air Force Base in New Mexico, arriving later that evening. Within a day of the crash, the two bombs were located in farmland around Faro, but as EOD specialists worked to defuse the warheads, they made a disturbing discovery. To understand what they found, we have to first examine the various safety and arming systems integrated into the Mark 39 bomb. A pair of arming rods extended into the warhead, which would automatically pull free when the bomb was released from the aircraft. These in turn were retained by a set of safing pins, which had to be manually retracted by the crew prior to bomb release using a long lanyard. At the same time, to arm the bomb, the crew had to turn the T380 readiness switch in the cockpit from the safe to the arm position, which would in turn activate an MC722 electromechanical arm safe switch inside the bomb itself. A similar switch on each of the two T249 aircraft monitor and control units, one per bomb, also had to be flipped from ground to air to pre-arm the weapons before takeoff. Finally, the crew could activate a lock mechanism inside the bomb tail assembly to automatically deploy the braking parachutes for low altitude or lay down delivery. As the bomb cleared the bomb bay, the retraction of the arming rods closed a set of switches that activated an MC845 Bish pulse generator, a bank of capacitors which delivered an electrical pulse to activate an MC640 low voltage thermal battery. Rod retraction also activated an MC543 42 second timer and closed closed valves sealing the reference chamber of the MC-832 differential pressure switch, which gauged the distance the bomb had fallen by measuring barometric pressure. Once the bomb had fallen a given distance, the MC-832 switch closed and passed current from the MC-640 battery to the MC-788 high voltage safing switch which in turn connected a still dormant MC641 high voltage thermal battery to the X unit, a capacitor bank that simultaneously fired the detonators on the primary stage explosive lens system. 
Next, when the MC543 timer finally counted down 42 seconds, it would close the switch to activate the MC641 high voltage thermal battery, which in turn could charge the X unit. Simultaneously, a 1A valve would open to inject a mixture of deuterium and tritium gas into the primary cores to achieve fission boosting. Finally, on impact with the ground, a crush fuse in the bomb's nose would connect the X unit to the detonators, setting off the fission primary and the fusion secondary and triggering a 3.8 megaton detonation. So going back to this accident, the two Mark 39 bombs involved in the incident were designated Weapon 1 and Weapon 2 by the accident investigators. Weapon number 1, serial number 434909, was carried in the aircraft's aft bomb bay, while Weapon 2, serial number 359943, was carried in the forward bay. Weapon 2 separated from the falling wreckage at an altitude of around 1,000 meters or 3,300 feet, but while the parachute activation mechanism had been activated, for unknown reasons the parachute failed to deploy. As a result, the bomb fell to earth at terminal velocity, burying itself deep in the mud, so deep in fact that it took recovery crews six days to recover the bomb's primary stage, six meters or 20 feet beneath the surface. Given the size of the crater, it was initially assumed that the conventional explosives in the primary had detonated on impact, but thankfully this was soon determined to not be the case, though the primary was heavily damaged. Meanwhile, the bomb's fission secondary stage had ripped free and buried itself even deeper in the mud. But after two weeks of digging, this component could still not be found. Recovery was greatly complicated by freezing temperatures and the high water table, with pumps struggling to prevent the excavation pit from flooding. Ultimately, after reaching a depth of 21 meters or 70 feet, it was decided to abandon the search. The secondary remains there to this day, buried somewhere under the North Carolina soil. Concerningly, examination of the recovered components revealed that the weapon's safing pins had been removed, allowing the arming rods to withdraw as the bomb flew free of the disintegrating wreckage. This in turn activated the MC845 Bish pulse generator, the MC640 low voltage thermal battery, the MC832 differential pressure switch, and the MC543 42 second timer. Fortunately, the bombers were released at low altitude and the MC543 timer thus only ran down 10 of its 42 seconds before being destroyed on impact along with the MC788 high voltage safing system. As a result, the MC641 high voltage thermal battery was not activated and the X unit was not charged, meaning the bomb could not have undergone a proper nuclear detonation. Furthermore, the valve mechanism had not activated, meaning no potential hazardous tritium gas was released into the environment. But it wasn't all good news. As Lieutenant Jack Reville, an EOD technician who helped defuse the bomb, later recalled, Until my death, I will never forget hearing my sergeant say, Lieutenant, we found the arm safe switch. And I said, great. He said, not great. It's on arm. This discovery suggested a disturbing possibility that the arm safe switch had somehow been activated without a deliberate command from the cockpit, meaning that if the bomb had had the time to complete its full arming sequence, it could have gone off. However, subsequent analysis by Sandy National Laboratory revealed that the shock of the impact had sheared the switch from its electrical contacts, preventing it from conducting a firing signal despite being in the armed position. In other words, on this bomb, the parachute's unexplained failure to deploy saved North Carolina from nuclear disaster. The same, however, could not be said for Weapon 1, which was discovered intact and upright with its parachute tangled in nearby trees. As with Weapon 2, the arming rods were withdrawn upon release from the aircraft. However, Weapon 1 was ejected at an altitude of around 2,700 meters or 9,000 feet, while, unlike Weapon 2, its parachute deployed as intended. As a result, by the time the bomb reached the ground, it had completed its entire arming sequence. Both the barometric and timing switches had closed, both thermal batteries had been activated, the X unit had been charged, and the crush fuse in the nose had closed. Only a single component prevented a firing signal from reaching the primary detonators, the MC-722 switch, still set to the safe position. That single, simple component, which could easily have been triggered by any stray 28 voltage signal, stood between North Carolina and Armageddon. Had the bomb actually detonated, the immediate blast, thermal, and radiation pulse would have destroyed or severely damaged everything within a 30 kilometer or 18 mile radius, started fires out to 100 kilometers or 60 miles, and blanketed most of North Carolina and its neighboring states with lethal radioactive fallout, potentially killing hundreds of thousands. 
Unsurprisingly, the U.S. Air Force was keen to cover up the truth about the Goldsboro crash, and official press releases and newspaper reports falsely assured the American public that the two bombs involved in the incident were unarmed and posed no immediate threat. Behind closed doors, however, the Air Force scrambled to correct the dangerous flaws in the Mark 39 bomb and B-52's design. As part of an upgraded program known as ALT-197, the MC-72 arm safe switch was replaced with a new version called the MC-1288, which prevented the MC-640 low-voltage thermal battery from being activated when the switch was turned to the safe position. This, in turn, prevented any component of the arming system from receiving electrical power unless the T380 readiness switch in the cockpit was manually turned to arm. Nonetheless, the Mark 39 was deemed unacceptably unsafe for the airborne alert mission and soon replaced with the more sophisticated B-28. Meanwhile, the B-52G and H models featured so-called wet wings without separate fuel tanks in order to significantly increase fuel capacity and range over previous models. However, as the Goldsboro crash dramatically demonstrated, these were highly susceptible to high stresses and metal fatigue and were significantly strengthened then via Boeing's stability, augmentation, and flight control program in 1967. Yet despite the extreme risks involved, SAC's airborne alert program carried on unimpeded, and unsurprisingly, many, many more accidents ensued. But it would take a further two major incidents on foreign soil to finally put an end to the airborne alert mission. On January the 17th, 1966, a SAC B-52G bomber flying a chrome dome mission over the Mediterranean collided with a KC-135 tanker aircraft and crashed near the Spanish village of Palomares, killing all four men aboard the tanker and three of the seven bomber crew. Four 1.1 megaton B-28 thermonuclear weapons were ejected from the aircraft, one fell to earth intact, the conventional explosive in two detonated on impact, contaminating the surrounding countryside with vaporized plutonium, while the fourth fell into the Mediterranean and was only recovered after an extensive 80-day search. Two years later, on January the 21st, 1968, another B-52G flying a chrome dome mission over Thol Greenland caught fire and crashed into North Star Bay. One crew member was killed and all four B-28 weapons aboard were destroyed, contaminating large areas of the sea ice with plutonium and triggering a major diplomatic crisis. And to learn much more about these two incidents, please check out our previous videos, Fire, Ice, and Plutonium, and that time the U.S. Air Force lost a nuke in the Mediterranean. Of course, the end of Operation Chrome Dome did not bring an end to nuclear mishaps, which continued on through the end of the Cold War and into the modern day. For example, on January the 25th, 1995, a civilian Black Brant research rocket launched from Andoya, Norway, was detected by Russian early warning radars and interpreted as a Trident ballistic missile launched toward Moscow by a U.S. Navy submarine. The Russian defense system went into high alert, and then President Boris Yeltsin was moments away from launching a retaliatory strike when the rocket veered away from its course and the alert was called off. And much more recently, on August the 29th, 2007, a U.S. Air Force Force B-52H bomber flew from Mignot Air Force Base, North Dakota, to Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, carrying six Raytheon AGM-129 ACM cruise missiles, which had accidentally been left armed with 150 kiloton W-80 thermonuclear warheads. <laughs> I'm in danger! These and other incidents all illustrate a contradiction in the deployment of nuclear weapons, known as the always-never problem. To be an effective deterrent, nuclear weapons must always always work when they are commanded to, otherwise an enemy might be tempted to launch a preemptive strike. At the same time, however, given their apocalyptic destructive potential, they must never go off when not commanded to. This impossible balancing act has underpinned most of the nuclear near misses that have plagued humanity over the last 80 years with this nuclear deterrent strategy. In the end, as the Whopper so sagely put after running through all possible nuclear war game scenarios, Strange game. The only winning mood is not to play.